So hey everybody, welcome to episode 294 of the More Than Just Code podcast. My name is Tim Mitchell and I am in Toronto, Ontario. I'm joined once again by Jaime Olympus Jr. in Seattle, Washington. How's it going? And we have Mark Rubin on the line in San Jose, California. Hello. Alrighty. So yeah, I'm um, just to start off with a couple of fact check things. Uh, I mentioned Ryan Reynolds last week. I couldn't remember what superhero he plays. And of course he, but he, I think he was the Green Lantern, but we're not going to talk about that. We're not talking about that. Uh, but he also played the superhero Deadpool in a couple of really good movies. So yeah, so Deadpool is who I was thinking of last week. And we were talking about Lee Krasner, who is an American, uh, I said ab- American ab- expressionist, which is not correct. It's actually abstract exp- expressionist, probably from what they would call the New York school. So, but American, female, uh, and happened to be married to a guy named Jackson Pollock, who you may have heard of before. So there you go. So, great painter. I've seen a, you know, a lot of her work around this, around the country. There's some nice pieces in, in uh, the San Francisco Art Gallery as well. Alrighty. Um, mm-hmm. Jaime, we have any Ask MT? Oh, sorry, I was going to say there is a real-time fact check on the fact check so uh, sure ryan reynolds has actually played deadpool thrice if i've got it right three times so twice in the you know more modern r-rated deadpool uh, movies but he was also the deadpool character in uh the wolverine movie oh really he, he played what hmm. was hypothetically the same character but it was not the same cinematic universe right right did he have the whole red leather outfit on or i think he had part of it at some point uh but it you know it's just not a great movie so it's very right. similar to green lantern oh, okay. it's like we don't talk of it sort of thing but we don't talk but about it's worth, one. worth okay, noting sure. before people right. start okay. shaking their their fists the podcast sure sure all right i didn't hear anybody shaking their fist last week when i stumbled on what what character he played anyway so there you go um but i definitely wasn't thinking about green lantern but now i am all right so do we have any ask mtjc homie we have a few all right and i'm gonna wait Let's for that it. airplane to go past all right. All right. We do. We have one from uh, George Tuparev who says, uh, Objective C was invented around 1985, reached the buzz status after the introduction of the App Store. How is the language halftime invented? That's a good question. So I think. I do answer him here. Yeah. So you did say, uh, pretty sure we weren't 100% serious. Generally, technology hype cycles last 10 years. And I think that's a good bit of clarification that it's not about the technologies dying per se in 10 years, just they're not really like the thing anymore. They might still exist. It might still be very useful and productive, but, you know, nobody was getting super hyped about Objective-C in like 1995 or 2000, even 2005, right? Like there's a long period of time where it was just kind of like, oh yeah, that's like a thing that Mac people use. Aren't Macs the things that Computer City has in in the very sad, dusty corner? And then, you know, uh, certainly the iPod helped to get the Mac out a bit more, but really the saving grace was the iPhone introduction, which kicked off a whole new refresh of the hype cycle. Yeah, I mean, to be honest with you, the, the, I mean, yeah, it came out of, I think, next, next operating system, next step. Um, I think oh, that's where Objective-C kind of found its footing and, um, you know, for I, th- for a while there, there was like nobody was writing Mac apps. Like, I mean, a few people were writing Mac apps, but not very many. You know, most people were still writing for Windows and that kind of stuff, right? So, um, yeah, the, the like you said, the iPod sort of kicked off Apple's, um, the, the iMac was one thing, the iPod was the next thing that sort of kicked them off, but the iPhone was like eclipsed anything they had done before, right? And uh, yeah, so I guess you could say that Objective C kind of took off around the App Store, but I think it was quite it was quite well in use before then. And I think by the time the uh, um, Mark, correct me if I'm wrong, but we had it was X, Objective C 2.0 by the time the iPhone came along, right? Like, isn't that when we got all the new stuff? It was, yeah. That's when we got properties and things like that in Objective C 2.0. Yeah, yeah. There's a really good book on effective Objective C 2.0 by Matt uh, Galloway, uh, one of the guys who used to be on the Ray Analytic team. But yeah, there's a thing called Effective um, Objective C 2.0, which is a real good book. If you're in, inclined to look back at that stuff, we'll get back into Objective C a little while later too, I think. Um, but yeah, so what else we got uh, for our fans of our back check or spot check? <laughs> Ask MTJC. We got another one from a friend of the show, sometimes former co-host Gregory mm-hmm. Archibald Heo Esquire the Third. Um, 
He says, uh, not COBOL, but I did Fortran at my first job. It was already right. super legacy code at the time, but you know, governments move slow. And then he's got an emoji right. with right. his uh, smiley face and some sunglasses. Yeah. No, I do remember him telling me about Fortran. I was a little surprised when he first told me that, but yeah, I did remember. All right. And the last one? Last one. I Hopefully I chose the right chain here, but it looks like this is one from you, Tim, about there, there yeah. being an app that stood the iPhone 4 on its end and would shoot 360 pano images. It apparently came out on Dragon's Den and Shark Tank, where I think Mark Cuban was the one who invested in that. Oh, Shark Tank. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because so it was called Cycloramic. I, I discovered it at, uh, at, at like on the last day of, of um, WWDC 2013, I think. And um, I can't remember if I met the developers or just or heard about it from another guy. I said, have you seen this this cool app? Right. And um, so I downloaded it. And what it would do is you would stand your phone up on its end and it would use the vibration motors to, to make the phone turn in a circle. And of course, they turn on the video and you could do a panoramic image or you could do um, or you could do a video, right? Um, and uh, it did, so it worked really well. And the reason why we talked about it was was the hype, uh, which we'll get to a little bit later, but the, the story was that people were predicting that the iPhone, either this iPhone that was coming out today or, or came out today, the, the SE, or the uh, iPhone 12, because I think we've talked about um, styles of phones last about four years and then they changed to make like the physical shape of them. And we're still like in the third or fourth year of the current iteration of phones with the curved edges, right? But the iPhone 4 and 5 both had squared off edges, which meant you could st- you could stand it up on its end, you know, watch a movie. You could stand it up on its end, take a photo if you wanted as well, right? Um, so wh- that's why it really lo- lent itself well to this. But it also worked on the iPhone 6. And what you would do there is, and there's a couple of videos online too, is you, you would take your, you know, your AC adapter. It's got like, it's got a flat bottom and it's got the two prongs sticking up. You would put it down on the desk and you would lay the phone down in landscape mode and it would ro- it would make the phone rotate it wasn't quite as slick as the iPhone 5 and 4 implementation but yeah it uh, it was pretty cool and so the reason why I added it here to the Ask MTJC is we got a ton of feedback or I got a ton of reactions from people about this about the idea of this phone and and, and this app and um, I actually happened to still have it available for me in the app store so I downloaded it just to try it out on my iPhone 10s to see if it would do anything it did nothing it wouldn't the, I guess the motors are in a different place Place now, or whether they're not as strong, uh, so we wouldn't wouldn't even it would I could feel it vibrating, but it wouldn't move. So I actually did a couple of fake uh, uh, panoramas where I actually turned the phone by my hand, right? So and I've, I've uploaded a picture here in the thread that you've got. There's a picture that I, that I took with the app at the Starbucks closest to the Moscone Center. Uh, a friend of mine who were there was there with uh, Diane. Remember Diane Marque? We were no. there, and, and and I was showing her the app, and they had a nice marble table, and it worked really well there. But and I've done a number of panoramas. But it was a cool app. It was a really, really neat thing. And, and um, yeah, in one of the threads we were talking about it, um, somebody had mentioned that it was on in the Canadian version, which is called um, Dragon's Den, and they didn't buy into it. But it went on on Shark Tank, and they got like half a million bucks in, in uh, VC capital from Mark Cuban, eh? So, yeah, yeah and pretty, pretty book. Even though folks will think, hey, it didn't turn out that well because, you know, the iPhone 6 sort of immediately with its rounded edges made that not so useful. Well, don't feel sad. They ended up selling... The the technology underlying IP for something like 20 some million dollars. Really? Um, wow. To some like car company that, that does 360 views of stuff. I don't, I don't remember. I, nice. I'm a fan of, cool. of Shark Tank and I do remember seeing the, you know, the 10 year anniversary thing and they covered like, you know, the successes and the failures where are they now. And that was one of the ones that had happened. They had, you know, what, what did you say Mark Cuban did? Like, like half a mil and he turned that yeah, sucker into whatever yeah. his percentage is of 20 some million dollars. That's, that's a pretty good win for everybody involved. Yeah, for sure. In, it, another indie app that kind of went went big time, right? So another app I remember from from you remember those you know those balls I forget what they're called um, they're like robot balls and uh, you can use your phone to navigate them around and stuff like that. Uh, oh, Sphero um, or something. Sphero, Sphero yeah, yeah, yeah. Something like that. The developer who who came up with that was at WWDC and he was selling them for like ninety nine bucks. You know when it when it were, and it was just plain white balls. They didn't have any like colors or whatever. And I don't think it had lights on the inside. But yeah, it was some cool some cool tech you see it at the early early WWDCs, but. You know, yeah, lots of fun. I mean, that's, that's again another reason why you go to these things to meet these crazy guys, right? Yeah. Where are they now? You wonder. Where are they now? They're all making sticker packs now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, for sure, for sure. Alrighty, what's uh, what's uh, what's up? What's next? These next two are bits of follow up 
regarding the uh, nobody likes UI button or whatever the, the title was for mm-hmm. the, the last time we talked about this, the Jeff Watkins dev blog post. So he's got a couple other ones where he continues to examine UI button on uh, dressing up your UI button and on dealing with constraints and etc. And uh, they're good reads, but um, you know, I'll, I'll read some, some choice quotes here. Uh, unfortunately, when we add a background to UI button, the code that adds spacing between the image and the title stops working. Working. I'm not exactly certain why, but uh, you can see the result here and the other blog post of like, hey, these very w- appear to be straightforward things. Like I sure would like to have an image, you know, to the left, to the right of text, uh, maybe above the text or below the text is, you know, it's not impossible. It's not even necessarily you know, difficult code per se, but it is a hassle and it feels like there's just not enough love in the UI button code itself. And I think that's why wrapping it up to the meta thing, I think that's why people when they bump against these weird odd edges, they say, forget it, just throw a tap gesture recognizer on a random UI view and call it good, right? Completely ignoring accessibility, completely ignoring a whole bunch of other things that you would get for free. Not saying people should do that, but I can completely understand that when the easy thing to do that you would think you could do isn't what you can do, you're, you're going to pick the other easier thing to do, even if it's the wrong thing. All right, I'm going to read this next one in en français, uh, and I apologize because I don't know how to say online in French, and I don't know how to say 19. 19- 19th as well. So anyway, la troisième édition de Swift Paris Online, c'est je, jeudi à uh, 19h avec Marin Todorov et Donny Walls. This is from Marin's, Marin's uh, th- uh, Twitter feed. He's going to be speaking at uh, an online uh, conference in Paris uh, on, um, I guess, the 19th of July. No, that Judy is um, Judy, Marty, McCready, Judy, Thursday. Uh, Thursday, I guess, this Thursday coming up. Or maybe tomorrow, whatever that works out too. I don't know. Check out Marin's, Marin's feed. But I just thought it was cool that there's going to be like a Swift Online uh, in Paris this year, I guess. All right. Wait, is uh, jeudi, is that Tuesday or is that Thursday? Thursday. Remembering the magic of time zones and time shifting for this very show. If you're listening to this episode, it is beyond Thursday. Unless mm-hmm. that was the 23rd, Tim. So the time well, yeah, is Yeah, I don't know. I mean, this, it's, it's tomorrow it's like for the, us. But... La troisième édition de Swift Paris. What can I say? I just, you know, that interesting that there's going to be a third edition of this this uh, of conference online. I don't know if it was online before. I don't know. But I guess it's follow up for next week, right? Uh, but Myron Tortorov, sometimes host of this sh- uh, co-host of the show and friend of the show and all that kind of stuff is going to be there talking about his uh, new the timescape. What's his new thing called? Time lane. Time lane. Yes. Right. Right. Which is a tool for examining uh, an instrument tool for examining uh, uh, combined uh, stuff. Alrighty. Um, so yeah, this story came out uh, just a few days after we recorded. Oh, my mouse has gone bananas again, um, that Apple has launched, uh, they've brought back their Today at Apple, but today, it's now Today at Apple at home, because obviously the, the courses that they would teach uh, at the App Store Apple stores are no longer available since the Apple stores are still closed. So they're now doing online courses for people to learn, you know, things like photography and drawing and things that you would do with your iPhones and your iPads and your Macs, um, you know, introduction courses, that kind of stuff. So yeah, just interesting that Apple is uh, keep bringing them back on. Uh, Bringing bring them out back out for people, um, and that's uh, that's cool. Um, another thing for follow up from last week was we were talking about NASA, and uh, again coming back to the COBOL thing. Um, they uh, and this is an article that I pulled back from our, our old uh, podcast notes that um, they were talking about uh, the fact that you know the the, the uh, programmers at NASA are, are retiring, and uh, they've got some old old satellites that talk to, and some of them speak uh, Fortran, and some of them speak COBOL, and so um, we're just following up on what we were talking about last week. So there's a link in the show notes for people who are interested in space, the final frontier. All right. Um, next we have, oh, so th- yeah, so this is, this is kind of spoiler like, um, uh, because we, we, when I picked the story up, we were just speculating. Everybody, everybody was speculating on, on this new phone that's coming out shortly, which is, you know, coming out this morning as we record on Wednesday, uh, April 15th. Um, but yeah, this article talks about in the Bloomberg news. I don't know if I can click on it anymore. I think I've used up all my free Bloomberg views, but, um, talking about how, uh, interestingly, that the new iPhone is going to be uh, predicting to be square square edged like the um, current iPad is. So that may be the iPhone 12 that maybe may have the square edges. And that's where, where I got into the thread about the the uh, Cyclorama app. Um, but, uh, you know, of course, they're talking about having this, this uh, 3D LiDAR camera system still. But I thought it was interesting, too, that Apple is talking about bringing out, and there's another article we'll talk about in a minute, uh, about uh, bringing out a new small 
smaller version of the uh, of the HomePod, uh, which Mark was speculating last week based on the pricing that uh, since they had lowered it, that they would be coming out with a new version. So apparently, according to this article, and this is backed up by Mark Grimman of Bloomberg, um, that it's going to be like half the size of the existing high, uh, HomePod and, and possibly less expensive, like half the price. I think you compete, according to this article, with um, the Googles and the Amazons who have lower lower capability, smaller, cheaper devices, right? And I think in this article, they talk about the, iP- the HomePod being a flop, I think was the word they used. You guys have a chance to look at this one? I hadn't seen that, but um, let's let's tease apart some of those things. So Lack of success is what they're calling it, yes. Comparative lack of success. That's a positive spin on flop. <laughs> I feel like it's fair to call it a flop, right? I, I think unlike uh, things that were called flops that were not like the Apple Watch, right, or the iPad, those are very successful products. Um, HomePod, I've not gotten any sense that Apple has ever sold those in any massive quantity. Um, right. And they're yeah. well behind. They're like sixth or seventh in market share. And you're like, wait a minute, after Google and Amazon, who are the other, you know, three to four people? It's like, exactly. The fact that you don't even know those uh, kind of tells you, you know, how, how floppy this thing is. Uh, that's not to discredit it as a device. I love my HomePod. I think the rest of you guys in the show seem to have enjoyed yours. It does, you know, for what it does, it does really well. They just, you know, it the, was it three forty nine or three ninety nine, whatever the original price was. Um, that's too much for what it does. And mm-hmm. I'm very curious on this this half of the price thing. Half of half of which price are we talking about? True. Yeah. Well, I mean, it is amazing. As speakers go, it's an amazing speaker, right? Like like it's kind of audiophile quality speaker, which I don't think the average user or average consumer is really interested in. Do you think? Not at well, three, not seven. at that price point. Yeah, I, I I totally agree that it was way too expensive and didn't do enough for the average user. Or I think if it were half the price, they would have sold quite a quite a few more of them. And if it if it did something like I know this is sacrilegious, but if it supported Spotify, let's say uh, instead of only Apple Music, because that rules out a lot of a lot of potential listeners. It, it does. It, just think back in the history. It, it, it it's from a product point of view, it was always kind of a weird thing for Apple. I mean, yes, yes, Apple always has had a, a foot in the audio door, but but the fact that they had a device that that didn't have any kind of screen, didn't kind of had any kind of API programmability. It's just odd for them. You know, it, it really was out of out of from outer space for them. I, I kind of wonder if if the technology was originally meant to be part of some other product, right? Yeah, like like the you know the the rumored uh, actual Apple TV, let's say, right? Yeah, um, and or maybe they had plans to get into the into more of the home theater market with the app with the actual Apple TV with the set top box and. And for whatever reason, those things just never materialized. So they, they had this technology, so they needed to do something with it. Because it, it always feels like, you know, with the with the watch, let's say, the watch, when it first came out, wasn't really a big success either. Right, yeah. But and it took a couple of iterations before it really took off and really became something that... Well, it had no killer really app wanted. at the beginning, right? Right. Yeah. And and so, but the Apple never did that with the HomePod. They just put it out there and then just kind of forgot about it. Right. Yeah. So it's kind of weird. Yeah. It's a it's an odd pr- I mean odd product. Like it's kind of like those sound bars you can get for the front of your TV. Like if you don't want to get into a whole you know surround sound the- home theater kind of system. Mm-hmm. Um. You know, like a lot of the, a lot of uh, stereo systems in 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 the two thousand the aughts or whatever. You know, started having subwoofers and you know speakers and stuff like that. But I think as sound you know. Like you got the, the the jam boxes and the Bose speakers and all those kind of like single things you could stream from your phone or from your Android device to it and have it play. Um, that's I think the home the home pod kind of fits into that sort of thing. And the fact that you can it integrates with Siri now gives it some functionality. But I, I mean to be honest with you, like we all use Siri all the time now in our in our devices, but it's not it hasn't really taken off. Like you like you said, like there's all these sketches and stuff you can get for your Android devices for your Alexa. You can do your banking. You can do you know listen to podcasts you can you know people are running quizzes for alexa all the time and we don't have that kind of funky capability in the home pod i'm doing air quotes yet because the next article is going to maybe maybe uncover some of that too right but um yeah it's kind of it's kind of an odd product right like yeah. it kind of sit, sits in your house and plays music right yep yeah and i totally buy the the hypothesis that mark has there that you know maybe it was meant to be part of some other mm-hmm. offering as an accessory and then when it came time is like, well, that accessory idea is not really going to work. And we're getting some heat for being so far behind the Echo and the Google right, Home. Right, so yeah, let's yeah. just take Siri and some duct tape, combine the two. And I think you wouldn't be that far off. I mean, when this product was announced, 
go back and find that episode of the show, I'll definitely notice something. I say, hey, you know, it's kind of weird that they talked about it for a while. And then at the very last second, say, and it's got Siri too. Okay, thanks. Bye. And then just ended, right? I was like, I was like what the heck? Where, where's the developer <laughs> yeah, story? Yeah. What's going on here? Why? How can you just yeah. throw in casually? Oh, by the way, it does Siri as well. And I think that's probably a, an artifact of like the fact it was not architected and designed specifically with Siri in mind. That was, I think, very, very clear. I'm going to call it fact. You know what? Until proven otherwise, I'm going to say this is so likely to be the case. It is factually true that Siri was not intended to be the main usage model for this thing. It was like controlled by some other device. It's definitely a candidate for Road Apple. You know, like there's been a number of products over the years that, that have just sort of been things you found on the side of the road left behind by a horse kind of thing, right? Because they just, they smelt bad. They didn't, you know, it didn't quite fit into anything. See, my big problem with the, with HomePod and with any technologies like these, like I always worry about, you know, gizmos and devices that need to talk to an app on my phone, right? Because we all know that the that apps even have a finite life cycle, right? How many apps have, have are, are no longer available because they didn't keep up with the 32-bit, 64-bit thing, right? And why doesn't the HomePod have a line in or line out? Yeah, it should. Like, it should. Like, like in, in 10 years from now, like, if I want to plug in some third-party device into it, I can't. I can stream from, you know, using using air sharing, but where's air sharing going to be in five years, right? Or 10 years? You know, so there's going to be a whole lot of, you'll be going to garage sales in, in, in another five years and finding all these HomePods just sitting there next to the Apple base stations and the Apple Expresses, right? Like, I bought an Apple Express last year for five bucks. You know, it still has functionality for me, but yeah, to the guy who owned it, he's like, what do I need this for? I've got my Alexa and I've got my Google and I've got my whatever, you know? Yeah. I don't now, need- you, could argue, you could argue that it won't be as bad as that. So, for <laughs> for example, the the net, the networking box that you're talking about, the you know the that's that's the, the yeah the base station that's limited by technology as sure. Wi-Fi advanced. You know, having a 802.11.b base station mm-hmm. or whatever mm-hmm. it was is not really that useful anymore. But the Express guys have a line out, Mark. But I agree with you about the line out, but but I'm just my point is that it's it's these may not be as useless because the speaker itself is always going to be useful. You just need a way to get the data in, and it's and it's possible that that at some point someone will come up with a box that sends over you know wi-fi or whatever it is sends just set streams music to your to your home pod even if you don't have a phone or don't have a mac or whatever anymore uh so you'll still be able to use it as a speaker the rest of the technology might not be used but as a speaker it it might still have a lifetime as long as as you know the spec is available that for someone to talk to it and some hacker will figure out how to do it if if uh if if the spec isn't officially available so it's so the speaker part of it is not inherently uh you know it doesn't have built-in obsolescence like like the like a wi-fi router would well i mean there, but i was saying that there's a whole category of products that apple's created over the years that are that were were flops right but anyway um i want to talk about the next thing because this is where i think the home pod starts to show some promise i don't know if you guys saw like last week that that 13.4 for the home pod came out um and i updated both of my home pods with it but uh apparently it's no longer running ios it's running tv os right um which and the, the argument here in the article is that that you know it's it's designed to be uh, driven by uh, like iOS has a whole bunch of battery management and power management kind of stuff built in whereas uh, TVOS doesn't need that because you know the TV's TV Apple TV's always plugged in right with a AC cord and so is the HomePod right um, but you know we do have some some functionality with with Apple T- with TVOS we can actually write things for TVOS and and uh, maybe that's kind of where they're moving towards having a HomePod have some more functionality like the TV does um, in order to be able to, you know, to write things for it. I, I, that said, I, I don't know. I mean, most of the TV shows that I watch and most of the TV channels I follow now have a TV app, right? So it's not like the, the development of, of Apple TV is dead either, right? But because um, it seems to be carrying on, right? As much as I would love that to be true, and I really, really would <laughs> love to be able to write apps for my HomePod, yeah. I think the other explanation that they gave is, is far more likely. Okay. Uh, the HomePod has the A8 chip in it. Oh. Oh right, yeah, and as does the uh, some of the older Apple TVs, yeah, uh, and and that's getting to be a bit old in the tooth or long in the tooth. It's getting oh. to be old technology. So rather than force the iOS team to have back back compatibility to the A8 chip, when none of the phones are going to run that A8 chip going forward, right? Even right. the the new low end one that we're going to talk about has an A13. Uh, rather than forcing iOS to be back compatible, they can just keep tvOS. Back backward compatible because it needs to be anyway for the right, Apple TV right. devices. I think that's probably more likely because TV 
iOS and iOS are, are actually pretty similar. And really, the only difference is, is the UI part. And guess what? The HomePod doesn't have any UI. <laughs> right. So, right. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. it's exactly the same for the for the HomePod. That's my guess. Unfortunately, although as like I said, I would love for the opposite to be true, but realistically, I have to say it's probably not. Well, and this is the thing. Like this, he's, he's bringing up again. Uh, the author here talks about this HomePod Mini idea, which I was just talking about. Um, this is a nine to five article I'm talking about from Billy Besposito. But um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, I kind of I kind of hope that you know, like like if Apple is going to stay on this this audio track, you know, um, and and this sort of smart assistant kind of idea, um, we'd hope that they would come out with more more facility for Siri for one thing, right? And then and tie that into whatever supports Siri, right? Yep. As long as Apple engineers are like you know duct taping things together, here here's a freebie. So you take so a tvOS based HomePod, right? So with the magic of the magic keyboards, magnetic cantilevered, you know, handle for the uh, the iPad. So if you take that and you duct tape that to the top of a HomePod, that can then right. have an iPad Pro as a screen. Now you've got an Echo Show competitor, and it also Ooh. works like an iMac G4. Now how much would you pay? Uh, a lot, because that, <laughs> that's a lot of device <laughs> that we put together. That's from well over a thousand dollars for sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, as Mark was talking about what's going to happen with the HomePod in the future, I, I could see people like taking them apart and, and figuring out how to how to interface with them there must be some serviceable port in them somewhere right you know somebody somebody will crack open the home pod and figure out how to yeah. make it make it serve coffee or something right so yeah right so continuing on our follow-up here i mean what do you got for github yeah we had mentioned about github's services getting you know more more stuff for free especially after the microsoft acquisition the newest thing that they came out with is that you can have i think previously you could have um unlimited private repositories that was something that they made free that was previously, you know, a paid for item. You could always have, ever since the beginning of GitHub, you could always have the unlimited uh, public open source pr- repositories. But uh, private repositories is sort of where they, they made money and they loosened it up before. And that's why this is follow up, right? Because they made the private repositories unlimited. So you didn't have to pay for that. And now you don't have to pay to have unlimited collaborators on those private repositories. So if you've got a, a burgeoning team, you have less of a reason to pay for stuff, uh, you know, as you go beyond the it was like three to five people you could have as private repository collaborators before. Wait, I'm confused because the last line of this article says they're reducing the price from $9 per user to a month to $4 per user per month, effective immediately. But how is that free for teams? I don't follow. Yeah, so so where they've changed things is that there are, um, if you look sort of like towards the middle there, they have more advanced features that they're calling there, like code owners or enterprise stuff like sign-on through SAML and other stuff. I think like protected branches, if I'm not mistaken, in private repositories is a paid feature. Right. Right. So they, they definitely move the line of, you know, how much is free and it's a lot more free now than it was before. They did reduce the price for their paid stuff. And it looks like their bread and butter is coming out of the enterprise sector for things like SAML, SSO integration. Mm. And they also are adding more with the GitHub Actions, their CI, CD, continuous integration, continuous deployment solution there. So I know they changed right. something in that. I think you got fewer minutes of activity off of that. But people said, well, if you, and, and don't quote me on the math because I, I wasn't using that myself, so I didn't know. But it sounded like when you account for the fewer minutes that you got out of GitHub Actions that now you're paying extra for, it still comes out less because they dropped the price per user, you know, to less than half of what it was before from $9 per month to $4 per month per user. Hmm. All right. Okay. Um, oh, yeah, this is a last little, this is, again, I, I, I had to originally put this in your article, in the article too, but yeah, there were two product announcements today that came out. One was one stolen the thunder, but the second one was kind of interesting too. Is now you can buy wheels for your brand new Mac Pro for six ninety nine, and uh, you can also buy feet for the. I thought it came with feet. That's why I'm confused here. But you can buy feet for uh, two ninety nine as well. So yeah, six ninety nine will get your feet. We, I think we were speculating for that a bit, for a while back. Uh, how much feet are going to cost for the uh, the Mac Pro? Right? No, no, in, no idea. How how they how they connect to the device, but um, yeah, apparently you can you can swap you can have buy it with wheels and you can buy it swap it out with feet if you want more stability and so yeah I don't know if you'd be riding your Mac Pro around the office or not or ever need to um, to be honest with you I don't really know why you would need feet unless it weighs a ton or something like that because um, I can't imagine you know moving a Mac Pro around all that much once you got it but what do I know maybe maybe Tony Hawk wants a Mac Pro <laughs> yeah the, the wheels is a little weird considering it's a device that has to be plugged in unless you've got it on the 
some sort of rig. You've got like a battery mm. pack on it, you know, that <laughs> you've duct taped it on there. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm, if you are listening to the show and you know of a reason that professionals end up having wheels on desktop devices like this, please reach out. Hashtag AskMTJC because I legitimately want to know because I can't imagine other than fun why I would want this. How, he- how heavy are these things? Have you ever lifted one? I, I have no, no idea. No, but um, uh, I've lifted. I've lifted the old Mac Pros, the old like the old um, you know cheese grater ones back in the day. They're sure. they're not they're not small, but you know. Yeah. But uh, it, we have these sweet uh, standing desks in one of our offices. They, they we had a couple of offices re- redone last year, and they actually have battery packs, right? So uh, theoretically, you could like you know so like they're not even plugged into the wall. That you have these rechargeable batteries. You pop them in to the desk, and and then you've got your your whole Mac and everything is all powered by by you know, wireless basically from from the point of view you're not cabled to to a hydro or, or wall socket right um so i don't know maybe that's the purpose or the, the the reasoning behind having wheels on your on your mac pro i don't know maybe you, you know connect it to your segway as you ride around the office and go to meetings right with your uh your uh, visa mounted uh xlr display as well it's an odd, mm. odd piece anyway yeah, weird a little, little bit of little bit of sunshine in in this these, this time you can buy some some feet for your wheels for your, your mac pro all right you know maybe a year from now we'll be looking back and saying wow can you believe that we didn't understand the whole brilliant <laughs> home pod wheel uh strategy that apple came up with and it's changed yeah, the world that's true <laughs> you never know yeah, maybe that's maybe that's what it's all about yep. all right well moving on to the uh, the main story so we had a story happen i mean jaime very dutifully put in like three or four stories into our main part of our show this week but uh, he got eclipsed this morning when um apple produced the iphone se second generation or iPhone SE as it is known. Um, we were speculating about the name of it as well. Oh, uh... Did I did I put should this be follow up or did one of you guys put that? I put that in. Yeah, I th- you know now that you say that I th- I was thinking about moving it just into, into follow up anyway. So anyway, let's let's, <laughs> let's carry on. But. These are general guidelines. I I could see the yeah. argument for making it follow up because we yeah. have hypo- everything's talk- follow up after a passion, right? Yeah, so mm-hmm. after episode one, right? So yeah, um, the, okay. I'm looking at the Canadian site, so I'm gonna, you're going to have to bear with me. So uh, I think it's three ninety nine. Oh, that's why. US. Yeah, this was completely confusing me. I followed that link yeah. and it's saying yeah. from five ninety nine. And I'm like, what? No, it was three ninety nine. What's going on here? Yeah. So wait. So so this is the part that I don't understand. I know that the, that the Canadian dollar is, and we've had this argument many times on the show before. The Canadian dollar is like seventy cents of, an, of a U.S. dollar, right? So how do you go from three ninety nine to five ninety nine just by changing putting .ca on the website, right? It doesn't. Where's my PCALC app when I need it? Oh, in my pocket. Anyway, carry on. I'm gonna I'm gonna do the math while you guys talk about it. It is one point four one Canadian dollars. Yeah. The, the U.S. dollar. I'm pulling up PCALC to do the calculation. So, and it's, a, it's a roughly two thirds. That's not too far. Off. Google says three ninety nine U.S. is five sixty three and twenty three cents Canadian. Oh yeah, then you got that extra bump that I was always talking about. Okay, well, yeah. okay, yeah. all right. It's uh, fair enough. Export fees, right? Fair enough. So the, yeah, so this thing is the same size as I believe the now defunct iPhone eight. If I think I heard that correctly. Uh, oh, I didn't forgot to link in. Uh, Rene Ritchie did a quick uh, video on this guy today. I should have put a link. I'll put a link in the show notes for that. But same 4.7 inch Retina display. Um, Mark already let the kept cat out of the bag with the A13 chip. Is the difference right? Uh, A13 Bionic chip as opposed to the A11. I want to say uh, in the current iPhone 8s. Um, yeah. So not the iPhone 5 form factor, which everybody loved about the SE, right? But I guess for people who don't need to spend you know a thousand dollars for a, a phone, um, this is a good uh, good entry point. And and an A13 is not too shabby, right? In terms of, uh, that's the same as in in the uh, iPhone 11. It's it's yeah, it's tremendous. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, well although they, they, you know there'll be an A14 probably when when the when the next one comes out. But right, but now, it's, but when, yeah, yeah. I was going to say the the uh, the original SE was a, basically an iPhone six, if I believe right. Guts. It was was it an iPhone six or an iPhone seven in uh, in an iPhone five package? It might have been I an iPhone sh- seven. Sh- I think it was neither one. Was it? I think it was okay. the 6S, if I'm not mistaken. So, oh, maybe 6S. Right. Okay, yeah, yeah, because yeah. yeah. it, it was definitely this 
weirdly over-engined thing that it had these super powerful internals for a small mm-hmm. screen that didn't really need to push a lot of pixels. So it performance-wise was was great. I don't know that it'll be quite mm-hmm. as dramatic of one for this one because you know the the difference in the iPhone eight size of of screen isn't so dramatically different from the iPhone eleven. But still, yeah. that's really cool that they have you know modern. Yes, it will be obsolete. You know from the new A something chip in five months. But hey, today mm-hmm. it's top of the line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's waterproof. It's got the, the glass back, so you can charge it on your on your key charger as well. So, and I'll tell you, you know, having Touch ID is kind of a bonus in this day yeah. and age of of face masks. Yeah, we were just talking today about uh, the fact that I can't use uh, Face ID with my with a mask when I go outside. And yeah, yeah. I, used to, I don't know if you saw last week's uh, artwork, Mark, but uh, we printed uh, Carol and I printed uh, MTJC logos all over my uh, my mask. Um, so we're we're joking today about you know finding a way to take a picture of my face and and print it on the the mask and see if I can use Face ID with it. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, so that was so the artwork that you had for last week's episode that was an actual photo? I thought you had photoshopped that for the pattern. No, no, that's a, I have two masks that have uh, have two styles of larger larger logos and smaller ones. Yeah, no, I, I basically went in went into Illustrator and Photoshop and made a made a uh, made, we basically made our own fabric design and yeah, Carol sewed them up for me and yeah, those are legit. I wear them outside in public uh, masks. Yeah, for sure, they are the real deal. There's only two of them in the world if people are really uh, clamoring to get one. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Put it on the swag store. That's a slightly that's a used. hot seller. <laughs> <laughs> slightly used. We don't know if they have COVID in them at all, but they, they may come with COVID. We don't know. We're not sure. Anyway, um, yeah. So what else? You get the COVID for free though, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. No charge for the COVID. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. No wheels though. You got to pay 600 bucks for the wheels. Right. Um, yeah. So pretty cool looking phone. I mean, you know, I think I, I I like the the smaller size phone. I like the six size phone myself. I mean, I had the six plus. Um, I like the smaller phones. What do you, I think you do too, right, Mark? I do too. Yeah. Yeah. I don't like the currently, currently the max size or the plus size the plus size yeah a little bit too big so what do you think about the people who are who are expecting it to be like the iphone 5 redone like it's because it's obviously a, a slightly larger phone right yeah i mean it, it'll, it'll probably be a disappointment for those people mm-hmm. uh because some people do like the real small one because of the you know right. just fits in a pocket nicely or whatever but mm-hmm. but i still think a ton of people are going to buy this one just because of the price point and the power well it also has that neural engine too because it's an a13 right so yeah. sure it gets true tone haptic touch augmented reality capability stereo audio recording that's cool faster wi-fi and cellular data oh, audio yeah. sharing i mean it's it's a great phone i mean if this phone had come out four or five years ago it would have been insanely good. yeah 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 and it's also got dual sim so you can have they're, they're saying here on the website we don't have this feature in canada that i know of but apparently you can run two phone numbers on it so you can have a, your business line and your yeah and the 11 line. has that yeah e-sim. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah well we have e-sims here as well but i don't know that any provider lets us use them so i could be mm-hmm. wrong about that mm-hmm. but yeah cool looking phone All right three different colors white black and product red product which red, apparently yeah. is going to the global fund to combat COVID 19 so that's the specific oh is it really it's no longer aids uh i don't know about the other devices i didn't go look but at least this one is focused on COVID 19 mm, nice okay cool yeah i think uh, the who we need, need some support um 64 right. gigs at 399 it, it, talking us 128 oh, yeah. at 449 yeah. 256 at uh 549 it looks like and people are noting that it does not have a headphone jack so that's another consideration what? from i think the se had one because it was the iphone 5 yes yes he 5S did, yes. body so uh, get, get yourself an airpods did not is that true did the six have one i don't remember i believe it was the seven that dropped the headphone jack yes mm-hmm. yeah 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 mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah and the imac dropped the floppy disk yeah yeah all right what's next what's happening in the ios 14 world there i mean so there's talk here of adding this feature called clips where you can use mm-hmm. parts of an app without requiring the full app download. Um, Hmm. This appears to be similar in concept to the way that slices or instant apps work on Android. But as presented here in, what are we looking at? 9 to 5 Mac. They're claiming here that you would have like a QR code that you might scan. Let's say, you know, if people don't know this feature, take out your your camera, find a QR code, scan it. You'll get a little, what looks to be like a push notification or a local notification that says, hey, do you want to open this up? Mm -hmm. You know, this URL. And presumably you will be able to do something that you can tap into and say, hey, my app App, you know, is uh, hey, we're we're open table, and you scan the QR code for this, you know, um, this flyer that you got in the mail. Like, you know, when you know, when we get through this whole pandemic thing, and you you want to come back to the restaurants and come hang out, 
cool. Um, scan this QR code. You get the full sort of native experience, but but only the minimal piece that you need to see the beautiful restaurant, look at its menu, and more importantly, make a reservation. Right, and you could do other bits like that. You could imagine something like um, you know you wanted to to buy a house, so you get like the Zillow or Redfin app, and you see the actual listing with its you know three D models and stuff. The the niceties, right, of what you would get out of a native experience as opposed to like a, a progressive web app sort of experience or, you know, just plain mobile web experience, but without having you, okay, well, uh, let me go download this entire app. Okay. Let me sign in. Okay. Let me maneuver my way back into this piece here. It's really trying to give you a contextual native experience. And I assume it would have to be built, you know, just like it is on Android when it, we're people who support this, you really have to build your apps with uh, modularity in mind, which to my mind means Swift package manager as sort of a way to pull these things down. Nice. Now, you know, it would be really cool. And maybe I shouldn't even say this publicly because I should, I should go and build this myself. But <laughs> what would be really cool is if it was integrated in with AR kit. So you're walking down the street and you see a business you're interested in, you hold the phone up to the business and the clip for that business shows up mm-hmm. on your phone. That would be really cool. That's using AR? Using AR kit. Right. Okay. Mm, yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I, I saw a proof of concept, proof of concept like that for Yelp back in the day, but yeah, yeah, that's the cool yeah. idea. Yeah. Right. The idea being that you, you had that entire app and you had to pull up that experience, pull things up the right thing. I think what I'm hearing Mark talking about is, you know, you're, you're like, just, you don't have the app and you, you look in the direction you, with your phone, you look in the direction of the restaurant is like, cool. I recognize that and this is something I can of the pull app. up a yeah, card you get a snippet for. of the app. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. That would be pretty cool. A clip of the app actually. Yeah. Now, am I wrong? Completely into non sequitur here, sort of, except for the name. Am I wrong or wasn't there a couple of years ago? Didn't Apple come up with this thing called Clips, which was little yes. snippets yeah. of social networking stuff that went nowhere? You're yeah, right. Yeah, and it has still, still around. languished yeah. for a very long time, but it was recently updated because I saw it get updated in my uh, my list. Yeah, it's an app called oh, Clips. Does it I have it on my, still exist? I have it on my phone. It's called Clips, yeah. Still exists, yeah. It was, it was all, the, all the rage. For a couple of weeks or so. In whatever so year. It like an, it's like an Instagram thing, right? Like, isn't that the idea behind it? It's, uh, it's more to create content for things like Instagram. And uh, to my eyes, it's kind of a, a proto version of what I can't remember which of these. I can't believe Adobe has two apps named almost the same thing. It's either Adobe Spark or Adobe Spark Post that it's, you know, does a, a, a bang up job of what Clips was trying to do. Okay. I'm just sending you guys a clip right now. Mm-hmm. I've got it on my app. Uh, one, two. I bought them. I've never opened it before, I don't think. <laughs> I, probably I think, yeah, I think, I think it was one of those, like it came with a U2 album, right? So yeah. Huh. This thing's out of control, this Clips app. So what's next? Next one is a whole bunch of interrelated links um, around the sort of bigger story, and that is Apple and Google partnering up on contact tracing technology to help fight the spread of COVID-19. Mm-hmm. There were definitely a lot of people who were freaked out, if only because of the logo, because people saw the logo of the Apple logo, a little bar, and then Google, and people thought, oh my gosh, is this the craziest merger? <laughs> <laughs> is this the greatest team-up of all time? Was the the oh, idea yeah. there and it is a team up but not uh, you know not a merging or acquisition sort of thing this is a team up for good team yeah. up for good yeah yeah so they're going to introduce technology into you know the apple and, and google platforms that mm-hmm. are interoperable with uh what looks to me like a, an open spec a couple of open specs and a uh framework api that can be used to help figure out you know have people been around other folks who are known to have the virus and if so you know give you an action that you can take to um, self-quarantine and, and get yourself checked out and other things. It's a very hand-wavy way of describing what's happening here. So we do have links, those of you driving at home, to the uh, privacy-preserving contact tracing that they're talking about. We've also got a link of, you know, how does this work from a user standpoint, right? And they show sort of an infographic with sort of two different sides of things. Like, all right, you know, Alice and Bob met each other, uh, like on a park bench or something. And while they were together, their phones were exchanging anonymous identifiers with each other, right? Over Bluetooth. Bob, it turns out, figures out that he has been diagnosed with COVID-19, right? And he, he enters the test result that he gets from his uh, provider, his healthcare provider into an app uh, with the public health authority. And with his consent, the phone uploads the last 14 days of these anonymous keys of like, you know, which keys did he see, right? Or did his phone see? And then that mapping can happen so that Alice can say, or can get a notification that says, hey, by the way, 
way, um, you were in contact with somebody who later had COVID-19. So you need to, you know, deal with that you know, again through quarantine or getting things checked out by a healthcare professional. But really it's about helping to stop the spread by making people aware of what's going on there and also helping the public health folks understand how this spread is occurring. That's important too for mitigation strategies. Yeah. And I think people are freaking out about privacy again, but, but it sounds, it sounds from what I've read about it, that it's all anonymized and, and, uh, and it's only, again, it's our trusted partners, Apple and Google. I'm saying that lightly, but, um, that this information is just identifies the device and, and use, I guess uses, um, uh, location tracking to keep track of where they were and, and finding that, you know, like, I guess, like you said, finding a series of keys because the biggest challenge for contact tracing is normally done by people using telephones and calling around and, and it's, it's well after the fact and a lot of, lot of manual work to go through and find out where, you know, where typhoid Mary has been, you know, and who she's been in contact with. And it's not necessarily that you sit down at the same table. It could just be you were in the same store, you know, um, the yeah. same Starbucks, right? It's, a, it's actually even better than what you're saying because it doesn't use location services at all. Right. Yeah. No, it, okay. it, it doesn't track where you've been. It only tracks who you've been around. Right, right. Uh, so so basically make it, it creates a tag every time you come close to another phone. It creates a pair of tags. Uh, you send it to one and, and the other one sends it to you. And, and each phone remembers that it's been near a phone with that tag. Uh, and then if if a person gets sick and they go to the hospital and say, okay, I'm sick, I want to share this, then essentially the phone can notify anyone who created that tag, which is just you, that you were around that other phone. So it doesn't know where you actually were. It doesn't know who you are. It just knows that, hey, whoever had this tag, you've been in contact and your phone has to go and say, oh, wait, that tag, that was me and tell you that. So it's actually it's it's actually very good for privacy because it doesn't keep track of your location at all. It doesn't keep track of who you are. It doesn't keep track of who you've talked to. It just says that I was near this tag. And then if that tag shows up on a list of, of bad tags, your phone will recognize, oh, I was near that tag and I better notify my my human that something something is up. And the tags were only used once. So it's not like the same tag is the same person all the time. So you can kind of track the trace of that person. You can't do that. You just know right. that. Right. And, and, and it's the healthcare professionals that are basically making the connection. Like like uh, when, when so-and-so gets diagnosed as positive, um, he volunteers to give his the identifier for his phone. And, and then that that goes into the healthcare system to or something like that to keep track of yeah, all the just, other devices you've been in that, contact with, right? It just yeah. makes that tag po- uh, public and basically announces to the world, hey, this set of tags, which are all the tags that, that this phone has sent out in the last 14 days, this set of tags are sick. So if you got that tag, do something about it. That's all it does. That's all it does. It doesn't say who the tag came from. doesn't say who the person was. doesn't say where it was. It just says, hey, if you got this tag, be careful. Oh, and then, and then maybe a notification gets sent out to the the phone that owns that tag is that the well, idea? I think, like, your, I think your tag has to no i think your phone has to pull to get it right yeah, yeah it yeah. won't send you a, a notification because that would so i'm looking at the chart here it on would the, know on who the, you are if it did I'm looking at the chart on tech front article um and of course this is the article the the the, the bunny is sick bunny uh, uh cartoon as well that home is posted here but um yeah this is saying that the the phone contacts the database periodically and and get finds out there's a match with the key right yeah yeah right. yeah so yeah, my, receives a notification. My understanding yeah. is that that happens locally. So you yourself are the one who knows and finds out that you were in contact with somebody who, who was uh, diagnosed positive. And then it's up to you. So the, the consent part is also a pretty key of this part. So the person who was diagnosed consenting to have their information put on there you know, for the greater good. And then the people who find out, um, it's not like they're going to have uh, jackbooted thugs sent to your door, right? That's not that's not what it's about. It's about getting the right. Well, Carol was saying today that the countries that are successful in, in battling the this, this um, issue, um, like I think it's what, South Korea, I think was one of them. Yep. Mm-hmm. Taiwan. Um, Taiwan. We're using this technology, and and they've been able to to flatten the curve just by by finding out who's been talking to who, sort of thing, or who's been in proximity of who, right? But they're not using this technology. They're using the old way of actually tracking down the people. Oh, are they? Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, they're not mm-hmm. using this technology. Yeah, but okay. but yeah, and and that's kind of the the whole point is that certain cultures are more open to that kind of thing, that kind of tracking, and others are less open to that. And the U.S. tends to be less open to that kind of thing. So it, so it would be less successful in the U.S. generally is the way 
is that's the way of thinking. Right, right, cool. All right. So the next article I got here is called Contact Tracing, and it's from our friends over at um, uh, NS Hipster. This one's actually written by Matt Triple T Thompson. Um, he wrote it a couple of days ago, and he's taken a look at the, the potential framework that Apple will provide uh, to do this uh, from a developer perspective and seeing in terms of how we would reuse this. And of course, he has no insider information. He says it right in the article that he's just sort of looked at the looked at the current um, uh, files that are available um, and seen like the header files, I guess, to see what uh, what is the you know the names of the methods and that kind of stuff that that you would use and how you know the looking at how core Bluetooth works and that kind of stuff with this this type of thing. How you create a unique ID if you're curious about that um, covers that sort of idea about how to use core Bluetooth to create a unique identifier for you know again this key that we're talking about that would get passed around um, and as well um, what's interesting is is this new uh, CT extro- or, or I guess it's contact tracing CT exposure detection finished handler uh, thing uh, what's what's cool about that is it's written in Objective C uh, from my perspective that's cool um, and that's where I mentioned or top of the show that we'd be talking about Objective C a little bit later here we are um, just interesting that 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 uh, this this new framework is written in that I guess they dusted off the old the developers to work on this one um, and they talks in the in the article about how to use CL CL location manager and that kind of thing to work with the class and uh, and use the, the methods to sort of come up with it right and figure out how this this might work in uh, in, in in your app I mean uh, I think somewhere in the article he says too that uh, something about iOS 13 we can't um, Apple disabled the ability for a device to do it on its own where did I see that so you I, I think it was related to like location tracking or or possibly Bluetooth tracking yeah we we can't do that but apple's apps can right so yeah I'll comment here about ios 13 pretty cool i mean a lot of this is speculation on his part uh but it's an interesting thought exercise about how this might work and and it's great that apple is is putting this technology out there and making it available for developers and they could easily they could easily have just built it into ios and it and provided their own app to make it work and you could you, you could use it and it would do a lot of good uh just having the apple app but but by putting it out as a public api you know who knows what else other people will come up with that might even be even better so that's great yeah i'm gonna guess that you're gonna end up having you know like in the united kingdom the nhs the national health or healthcare system or service whatever that nhs stands for would be used and then i know that uh, tim you showed us stuff that like canada does right with the the covid19 app that you'd mentioned as follow-up last time so i wouldn't be surprised as each sort of region has its sort of official app coming for, uh, for the u.s i assume it'd be like the cdc and the center for disease control as an example so i think that's why it's not just the uh, oh pre-installed that from Apple or pre-installed from Google. I, I'm going to guess that's why they're doing it as a this framework that is is written in uh, 1985. Marty McFly's uh, Objective C, not Swift. <laughs> <laughs> Interestingly enough, so your mom's Objective C. How, yeah. how do you feel about that hype cycle now? Right, it's it's, uh, it's still yeah. still chugging along, still still doing good work. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's interesting. Like, wouldn't you think that? Like, okay, so um, you know how everybody's like like people use things like Facebook, they use things like Twitter, they use their bank app, right? I mean, wouldn't you think that that would be a good place to deploy this stuff, to try and spread the net as far as you could to get as much data as you could? I mean, like, if, you, if they built into the OS, that's one thing, but people could just simply opt out of it, right? And defeat that whole purpose. But like, if, like, as developers, wouldn't you think this would be, you know, for the greater good to to add this framework to your device, to your, maybe, maybe um, Pi Day Countdown could have it, Jaime? What do you think? Yeah, there's... It's kind of weird and interesting because I think it's a it's a big power to have, right? And you would not be mistaken for thinking of like, wait a minute, isn't this what happened in the Dark Knight when when Batman <laughs> turned on the the phones uh, to on everyone in the world oh, yeah, into right, the yeah. network so he could find where the Joker was? Um, right, right. You know, it's it's conceptually not that dissimilar. And I think there's, uh, I mean, in that case, it was a, a rogue vigilante outside of the the law doing things, you know, ostensibly. For for good, but um, you know, even Lucius Fox is like, dude, this is not cool. You, I'm, I'm not hanging out with you anymore. Like, really. we, we, you crossed the line here, right? This is a power that people should not have, and um, I'm not saying that's the case here, but it, I think it's proper to address that, right? Of, of having um, care and, and candor around how is this stuff being used, and I think that's why it is pretty nice that uh, you know, whatever you would think about Google's part in it, certainly Apple's perspective on making sure that this is you know privacy enabled um, and yet still useful as a, as a networking. Sort 
sort of tool is something to consider, I think. So that's a very long way of saying like, it, it, I can see the for the greater good, but um, matching up against privacy and liberty, I think is, is very important, even with that in mind. But, sorry, isn't this implementing the, the methodology that we just talked about that is private? That's kind of the whole point? Yeah, yeah. I mean, but we're, we're taking a lot of, of faith here about like, how is this stuff being used? Right? Yeah, that, like, and, and that there won't be a bug that actually exposes who you are and things like that. Yeah, you know, you, you know yeah. well-intentioned things that turn into bugs or, uh, you know, surreptitious things. We, we've got stuff that we can see now, the, the how is it end up being used and uh, requirements around things. Um, I don't want to uh, dissuade people from using this stuff, but I, I think it's a careful thing to think about. I'm generally very positive about this. I think this is a good idea. I think we absolutely, you know, it, it is sort of late in the game for where we're at now, but we can't change the past. So hopefully this stuff sets us up better for the future so we can avoid some of the worst bits um, and things to come in the years down the road. Yeah. So from a from a uh, interesting point of view, there, there's also a link in the article. This is our real time follow up um, to the Android specification as well. So if you're if you're on the other side of the fence there, um, in in the middle of this article, maybe I'll separate it out as a separate link to the thing. There's a discussion of the Apple slash Google Android contact tracing API as well. So um, you know I've looked at a little bit of Android code of my time, but um, yeah, this looks pretty pretty good too. So just just to get if you want to get if you're curious about what this is going to look like as a, as an API, um, yes, Apple and Google have already um, started documenting this stuff, and this is like version 0.4 of the documentation. Subject to change, of course, but um, yeah, just uh, the cool cool tool. So I think that's that may be the intention. Why would they create the API if they don't want us to use it, right? For the greater good. Indeed, by the Joker guy. I mean, it could. I mean, this kind of technology. I mean, I, I know right now we're talking about COVID nineteen and stuff like that, but you know, it could help with Amber Alerts. It could help with you know other other things like a lot. You know, these days, kid, most kids have a, a cell phone, and and um, you know, you would you would think that you know this could be used for other other purposes other than just you know trying to figure out who's uh, who's infectious and who's not, right? Just other way, like you said, finding the finding the Joker in a in a haystack, right? Um, of people. Yeah, and this could have, but it but it doesn't actually help you find the person. That's that's a thing. It oh, doesn't, true. Doesn't right, do that right. at all. That's kind of the whole point. It it only says who you've been in touch with. It says right, nothing about right. where that was or when that was. Mm, true. Right. I gotcha. Yeah. It doesn't have the Batman technology. Nope. Yeah. It it is based on rough proximity, just given the nature of Bluetooth, and that it um, doesn't have very long range, and the range drops pretty dramatically yes. when anything gets yes, in front of it. Nine meters or something. Yeah. Right. It's yeah. thirty meters or but, so in a, on on a good yeah. day. But um, as you get, it, it, it is true that a bad actor could, in theory, use the data from this in conjunction with tracking location. Right. If you wrote your own app, you could track your location at the time that you got this tag. Right. And track where that tag was. Now, since every tag is different, though, it's hard to see how anyone would use that. But yeah, yeah. Because it's not like, so if I meet you, Tim, and you get a tag from me, and then a minute later, I meet Jaime, and he gets tagged from me, they're different tags. Yeah. So, so you knowing where my tag came from, um, it doesn't well then yeah if your phone and Jaime's phone were somehow talking to each other then I guess you yeah. could say oh um, these two tags both came from the same place within a certain amount of time so there's a pretty good probability that those both of those tags came from Mark mm-hmm. and then with a with a big with enough people in the network then you could potentially track my path. I guess. Into it. Doesn't your phone currently um, track where you've been recently? My phone does, but your phone and Jaime's phone don't. Yeah. Well, it's, what's I'm saying? Like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Because there's something in in general. So I'm just looking at my app right or my phone right now. Something about location services, right? There's like a map of where you've been recently. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean that. But it's okay for me to know where I've been. But you know. But for. But if Tim, if I don't want you to know mm. where I'm, where I've been. But. Right. But what do you get to hide, Mark? Come on. You're, yeah. You're malicious app can can <laughs> tell you where I've been by tracking my jumps yeah. from I talk to you, then I talk to Jaime, then I talk to someone else, then I talk to someone else, and it correlates in space and time and, and tracks up my, my path, and then it mm-hmm. sends it back to you, Tim. That's, I guess, a potential way of exploiting this. Well, look at this. I'm sharing my location with Greg Heo. Mm. Ooh, that's, that's, that's dangerous, I think. Right? Interesting. Yeah, here it is. System services. Come on, show me the map. Where's the map? Yeah, like I've opted in a whole bunch of like location services to help you know improve iPhone analytics and you know popular near me routing traffic hmm. reminds me that that video we 
talked about once where the the senator was talking to the guys at Google about the fact that even though they turn off all of the location stuff, Google still tracks the location of the phone. Remember that story? Yeah, it is anyway. hard to, to lock down that sort of stuff. Yeah. Well, and, still, and still have functionality. Like, you know, like like your phone needs to find a cell tower, right? To be able to, to be functional as a phone, right? So there's got to be some give and take. Can't turn everything off. All right. So let's move to our picks. I mean, what do you got for us this week? Mine, uh, these two links are for uh, a book that you can you can pre-order. And full disclosure, this is friend of the show, Rob Whitaker's book is titled mm-hmm. Developing Inclusive Mobile Apps, Building Accessible Apps for iOS and Android, available on uh, nice. A-Press or, or Amazon, mm-hmm. depending on what you want to do and how you feel. So I've... Well, this is the guy that was on Twitter the other day talking about this, right? Yeah. So uh, Rob is a iOS development engineer working at uh, Capital One in the UK. Uh, mm-hmm. We've met a few times at uh, iOS Dev UK and at uh, Code Mobile in uh, 2019. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's given really good talks, uh, really good conference talks related to accessibility. And in this book, uh, he does talk about accessibility and, and inclusivity with regard to mobile apps. And it's pretty right. good. I've got a, a, a preview copy that I've been um, mm-hmm. sort of reviewing and it covers a lot of good topics. So, you know, it's not just about iOS. There is Android as well. Uh, it covers what those platforms provide in terms of accessibility. Uh, this book also talks about, you know, how you end up testing for accessibility to make sure that stuff works, right? This is sort of in line with what we were talking about with like UI button, you know, for all of its pain does give you a lot of stuff out of the box, right? And that's why I'm very critical of, of Apple not making it so that UI button doesn't have the pain, right? We, we keep talking about in the show, like make the best thing to do, the easy thing to do, right? Because I'm lazy. <laughs> you know, don't, don't roll your own, you know, security framework, just, just use Apple's because they're good at doing it. So as long as it's easy to do, we'll use it. Same thing here, right? With regards to accessibility. And this also covers more than just, I think, what a lot of folks would think about in terms of inclusivity, right? So certainly it covers um, disabilities, right? You know, like uh, low vision capability, um, motor impairments uh, or limitations, you know, maybe um, hearing impairments. But it also covers things that we don't normally think about, such as, you know, financial ability or uh, gender and sexuality. Like those are things related to inclusion that aren't necessarily related to uh, disability, right? It's still about accessibility, right? So I guess spoilers for the financial part, but is uh, something to think about of like, you know, people who are um, financially disadvantaged also tend to overlap with folks who do have some sort of impairment, right? Maybe they, they can't work or their, their ability to, to have an income is very limited. So it's kind of difficult when, you know, you drop a version of iOS that supports their device because they can't necessarily afford a new one, right? Even as we were talking about the, the low, low price of the 399 iPhone SE, that could still be a lot of, of money for folks. And it's something to think about, you know, not to sort of, you know, uh, wag our fingers at, at developers, but just, you know, not being cavalier about it is, is I think an interesting thing. So that's what I've been enjoying in this book. Again, you can pre-order. looks like it is due to be available on May 7th. Is that what this says on A-Press? Yes. And for me, it's kind of interesting because I, I read the book and because I've, you know, interacted with Rob and had beers and stuff at the conferences, it's kind of trippy to like hear the book in his voice. That is new to me. Yes, yeah. And he's no relation to Jody Whitaker, right? I can neither confirm nor deny because I don't know the answer. <laughs> just, just like sure uh, distant, distant past. Just there, like, maybe, yeah. you know, um, Tashi Yar, Denise Crosby is actually related to uh, Bing Crosby. Right, and yeah. in my mind, hypothetically related to Sidney Crosby, the hockey player. Really? Hmm. I don't know. We, we need to look it up, right? Who knows? <laughs> well, they come from the same clan but way back in the day. Yeah, exactly. Wait, I thought Denise Crosby was Bing Crosby's daughter. Or something like no, granddaughter, granddaughter, I niece, think. granddaughter, oh, granddaughter or niece, okay, or something right, like that. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Sydney Crosby, the hockey player, I do not believe has any. I don't think it's like her cousin or something, but it could be. Who knows? Well, there's also there's also a Canadian politician, John Crosby, but I don't think they're related either. So. And there's David Crosby too. David Crosby, true. Yeah, he and he's related to Melissa Estridge's kid. Hmm. Did you know that? No, no, I did not. Uh, see, what do you know? Well, Melissa Etheridge and her wife had a child, and apparently he was the donor. Ah, okay. Ha ha. 
All righty, moving on. So, um, this, I was fascinated by these these uh, these war stories, as this one's called here uh, from Ars Technica. Uh, stumbled across this one the other day, and it's uh, basically an autobiog- autobiographical story of Jordan Mechner, who is the guy who, at you know the young age of twenty something, uh, hit the world up with Prince of Persia on the Apple II computer. Um, and it's a video piece, and he, he goes through, and he's got like snip snapshots of himself back in the day uh, talking about how he developed uh, the Prince of Persia game and I'm sure you guys have probably played it if not on uh, the Apple II you might have played it on the Mac or on Windows or on uh, Nintendo or Sega or whatever it's been it's been around for a while t- a long time and uh, it was his second game the first game was a was a karate game that uh, he came up with and uh, talks about you know how when he was developing the app um, he had to figure out how to animate these characters and of course you know working with you know the limitations of, uh, of the Apple II I think it only had four colors. Um, it had 16 megabits, megabytes of memory. A lot, a lot of, and you had to basically make these these apps in a really small amount of space, right? And uh, back then, you know, you didn't have Photoshop and stuff that you had to actually create each uh, each pixel on the screen and uh, and design it. And he can, and it's interesting if you ever played the game and you've seen how the you, you've obviously if you have played the game, you you're familiar with the way that the uh, the Prince of Persia runs and jumps and you know, grabs on the ledges and stuff like that. And he talks about how he, to animate that stuff, he filmed his brother, his younger brother, uh, in a parking lot, jumping and, you know, doing all these kind of things. And when you see the, and he took the, um, the technique called rotoscoping, where you take the film and you go frame by frame, like the old Disney animators used to do, and creates each character, each frame of the character. Uh, he shows some early working um, uh, mock-ups of, of this stuff in, in his, in black and white, basically. And you see the, the, the film of his brother jumping, and then you see the the um, rotoscoped animation, and then you actually see the Prince of Persia in the game, and it's like totally the same guy jumping, right, kind of thing. And he goes on about how you know he was sort of working on this this uh, this game, and one of his one of his uh, co creators kept saying, you know, you need more combat, you need combat in this game. It's one thing's missing from the game, and so finally he went back and added in some some combat. But the thing he was pushing up against the whole time he was developing this app was the fact that he had a very limited amount of of RAM to or, or memory to work with, and so a lot of the things he ended up doing, um, he came up with one of the one of the key opponents in the app um, by uh, called Mirror Shadow Man, I think was was the name of it. And what it was is it was a character that you were the you were the Prince of Persia, and Shadow Man mimicked your every move, right? And you know he would get into sword fights with you, and he would he would steal your potions and and trip things for you and, and get in your way. Uh, but the reason he did he came up with Shadow Man was because of the limited amount of memory he had. The f- the easiest thing he could do was just reverse out the pixels and make a negative version of the character and that you know and that was an inexpensive way to to have another character an opponent in the game and uh, and do that kind of stuff and and basically have you know without without using up a lot of resources he was able to do that right so it's a really interesting story it takes about i think it's about 15 minutes long um but yeah if you're if you're into sort of the stories about how an app like this kind of came into being and the kind of challenges he went up against um you know, uh, check it out. It's really, really interesting story. So I don't know if you guys are, you're probably familiar with Prince of Persia, right? I actually never played it, but of course, I've heard really? of it. Yeah. Oh, okay. By the way, you, you mentioned, you mentioned 16 megs of RAM. Oh, 16. I think it's more like 16 K of RAM. Yeah. It was really, really small. Yeah. 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 Really yeah. small footprint. And, and yeah. And I think, yeah, like, was it 6804, 60, 6502 yeah. yeah. processor? It was the Apple two? I used to program 6502 a little bit Did you? back in yeah. the early days on my Atari 800 computer. Yeah. Yeah. Back when RAM was pretty sparse and hard drives, I didn't even have a hard drive when i first started we've talked about this before yeah. but uh, yeah yeah definitely 64k was mm-hmm. about the max well it was an 8-bit system so you had 60 up to 64k yeah well, actually memory. what he's done too is he's he's uh come up with a book i'm not sure if this is an old story or not but the there's a hardcover book and a paper cover book paperback book of the making of this thing and he's got some of the pencil sketches he made of of all the animations and stuff like that uh yeah so yeah march 2nd 2020 so it's just brand new um it's just kind of, you can pre-order it actually now. Um, the making of Prince per- Prince of Persia. So cool. mm. and you know it's the same one that he made the Disney movie out of and all that kind of stuff too. So oh, it's cool. He's got a Lego. There's a picture of a Lego character here for Jaime and his Lego fascination these days of the Prince of Persia hanging from the edge of your table. 
<laughs> made out of Lego. That's cool. Yeah, nice. the thirtieth anniversary of uh, Prince of Persia was was June of twenty nineteen. So really cool story. Anyway, check it out. It's pretty nifty how people found ways to get around limitations. The the thing you were talking about with the mirror sort of mm-hmm. sprite is kind of reminiscent of the Nintendo's Super Mario Brothers. If you notice right. the clouds and the bushes look yeah, yeah. the same. They're just different colors because palette swaps right, are yeah, super easy yeah. to do, right? But the, the same graphic art is being used and you don't even really think about it or notice it. And now that I've told this to you, you will not be able to unsee it. Yeah, well, like the one thing is about the, remember the old Flintstone cartoons where, you know, Fred and Barney would be running across the room and, and the, the background would repeat. He'd run past the same lamp and the same couch and the same TV. You know, just uh, the same sort of idea that they were being very economical about uh, the animation stuff. Stuff, right yeah they had like three panels <laughs> it seemed of uh, of background that they would just whip by really quickly yeah very very low tech i mean low tech approach to to getting this done but i mean it's it's an amazing feat i mean the fact that he was able to create this game and um and that was back in the day when you you had like you know you literally had to design every pixel right so cool stuff and anyway, fascinating check it out if you have the time so back in those days, we used to use something called alternative character sets. Oh, yeah? So you're, you had your font, essentially, uh, which was defined as a set of 8 by 8 pixel icons, I guess you would call them, right? Back glyphs then. or whatever, yeah, yeah. Yeah, back, well, back then, they were, they were barely glyphs, right? Because it was only eight, 8 pixels by 8 pixels. So, so one thing that you could do was you could essentially create a brand new font, a custom font, with whatever you want, with whatever 8 by 8 patterns you wanted. So what you could do was you could you could create uh, you could you could use your font the define the characters as little graphical elements and then print text on the screen and because it would print with these alternate character sets with these graphical elements you could actually build up graphics oh right yeah yeah so so you'd actually have your your, your scene your image would actually be made up of of text but non ASCII text yeah co- super common technique back then yeah well I mean like if you look at those black and white Mac paint drawings. I mean, that was the same sort of idea. You were painting with with a series of characters as opposed to actual paints or pixels, right? Mm. Like, I don't know if you, I don't know if you, I mean, you had a, I don't know, Jaime didn't have a Mac back then, but like back in the classic days, like, you know how we have desktop, desktop images now, where well, back then you had a pattern on your desktop, either had solid or, and your Mac came with a bunch of predefined patterns, but there was a little, a little thing where like a, a resource editor where you could actually go in and create your own little pattern and designs. I used to make them yeah. all the time from my yep. Mac and cross hatchings and you know, herring bones and stuff like that and just, you know, play around with the patterns on your desk, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was, I mean, there was a lot of art behind uh, what went into into early, early, early days, like hyper card stacks and stuff like that, right? Well, this stuff that I'm talking about was, this predates the Mac. This was, oh, I know. This yeah, was yeah, yeah, yeah. to, Sounds, you know, Atari yeah. 100 days. Um, this is probably 1981, 1982 back then. And that's interesting though, because yeah, when you when, when I talk about building each, each character or each pixel, like, I mean, yeah, so he probably did the same sort of thing. He does show some of the code in 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 uh, when he was talking about that stuff you know like you got the hexadecimal string right um that defines what the pixel is kind of thing yeah, right but yeah, but, yeah. but yeah but like you said you could lay that out in into a font and would you still have 256 characters or something like that in, in a font set or you probably had 256 yeah eight yeah, bits yeah right. eight bits worth yeah. cool yeah, yeah. Hmm. cool stuff yeah. back in the day yeah. the old hand assembly yeah is that actually assembly that you're writing when you're doing that so uh usually back then then we would we would do most of the work in basic right but but basic had these commands called poke and peek which okay. would let you write into a memory location so you could you could take just a whole you could take your assembly language you mm-hmm. could you could write an assembly language but usually you would take your assembly language and, and essentially compile it to you know the bytes and then and then use these pokes and peaks to to write it into your basic code right. and then and then run that from your basic code as like a function so if you want to do high speed stuff, higher speed stuff. You need to drop that into a similar language, mm. or you could. I mean, you could just uh, on the Atari. You could just pop out the basic cartridge and plug in the assembly cartridge. <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> And then right. you could then you could start programming an assembly. Huh. Yeah. By the way, real time follow up here. I just found a link to this uh, this book. It's seven ninety seven ninety nine for a PDF for uh, EPUB version. Huh. And uh, let's see. Click on the Amazon link. Yeah, seventeen dollars will get you the uh, the hardcover, and sixteen dollars will get you a paperback. Cool. Nito Pichikino. Yeah, and ka- uh, Karate Karateka was his first uh, first game. That's the karate fighting game. Amazing stuff. I'm trying to find a picture of the Atari assembly cartridge here. Hmm. Yeah, if you look in the 
second link, I didn't realize it was actually a Wikipedia article, but it is, and scroll down about halfway, it shows a picture of the basic cartridge. This, this is an actual thing you just plug into the slot. Ooh, I hadn't seen that. That is, no, there's a swag idea, right? Like, you know, wouldn't you want like a Swift cartridge? I mean, yeah. really, it's going to be like a, <laughs> a USB awesome, drive or yeah. something, but yeah, it'd be sweet. Yeah. Yeah. So that Atari 800 that they're showing in the history article, that's the one I had. That was my first computer that I owned. So the thing at the top was a little door that you would pop open. And if you scroll down to the second image, the one that says system specs, yeah. Atari 800 and cartridges. So you'd pop open that door and you'd plug those cartridges in and then close it. And then you'd be in, in that program. Huh. So, and that's the only way you could change programs was by plugging in a cartridge. They have the old ads too. Yeah. Cool stuff. Back in the day. Yeah. Checking if Halt and Catch Fire is still on Netflix. Purchase any Tau Toli 32-bit Sterling set. They'll give you a free Atari 400. Yeah. Where did you see that? It's uh, the first ad that's down the page. Oh, yeah. You buy some silverware, they'll give you a computer. That's funny. Yeah. So the Atari 400, that was the lower end one. Yeah. And that one had a membrane keyboard. Oh, really? Oh, right. Yeah, I remember the old Sinclair. There, there it is, Sinclair on the side there. That had a membrane keyboard as well. Oh, there's no picture. I have an, I have an Apple IIc here somewhere at home. Yeah, Carol found these things at the uh, usually at the junk store where they were being junked back in the day. That's why I got my first bunch of Mac, my first um, 128s and 512s and stuff like that too. People were throwing them out. It says uh, you can have affordability, expandability, or convenience. Pick two. <laughs> so that's for the Apple II. Interesting stuff. I have a schematic signed by uh, Waz too of the Apple One computer. So one of the ones in the list on this screen is the Altair. You, you remember that one? So a friend of mine had one, had an Altair. Um, and I didn't find out about this till years, years later. I didn't know, I didn't know him at the time. Right. But he had an Altair, uh, and he still had the original manual programmer's manual for the Altair. And he showed it to me once and the front page of the, of the, uh, of the manual programmer's manual said, here's our something to the effect of here's our programming manual. If you have any questions, call Bill Gates with this phone. Really? Number. Yep. And there was Bill Gates' phone number right there. <laughs> wow. We tried calling it once. It, nobody answered. <laughs> yeah, I bet. Yeah. That's cool. That is cool. Yeah. All right. All right. So I guess that's it for another week. So, hey, how many people want to get in touch with you? Where would they find you? I'm on Twitter as at Dev with the hair. All right. And Mark, if people want to get in touch with you. Mark R at smapsoft.com. Right. And once again, my name is Timitra, T-I-M-M-I-T-R-A. And the Twitter machine is where you'll find me hanging out. So until next time, we'll say bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. This has been another episode of the More Than Just Code podcast. If you want to find out more about the show, you can visit the More Than Just Code website at mtjc.fm. There you can find a summary and show notes of each episode. We list links to the apps, code, and news that we mentioned on the show. If you like the podcast, tell your friends. Please leave a comment on the website, and if you can, please write a review on iTunes. And please recommend us in your favorite podcatcher. All of these things help others find out about the show. We really appreciate your help with spreading the word. We're also on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. We'd love to hear from you. So use the hashtag AskMTJC. Once again, the podcast Twitter account is at MTJC underscore podcast. Please consider supporting the show by pledging any amount on patreon.com slash MTJC. Thanks again for listening. We'll see you next time. I have trouble getting through a Discovery episode without falling asleep. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, it's it's just not that good. Sorry. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's Star Trek-ish, but, you know. Yeah. I, I, I see I see your point. Like, there are some there are some episodes that are just, you know, whatever. But, I mean, like, like Jonathan and, and um, Jaime really like characters like Tilly, and, you know, she's a bit odd and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Have you have you gotten to second second season yet? Yeah, I'm, I've only, yeah, I'm halfway through the second season. Yeah, it's, I call it Search for Spock, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I just saw the one where they did the, uh, they uh, went to the, they found the section 31 site. Oh yeah. And yeah. then the robot, well, I won't spoil it, but the robot, the robot crewman, crew member. Oh yeah. What's her name? Yeah. 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 I don't know yeah. what her name is. That's a, it's yeah. a Canadian actress actually. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh. Sarah Milich. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. She comes back as another character. Like, like it's funny that you recycle the same actress. She plays a, yeah. a human, human in, in the next couple of episodes. So maybe she was signed to a contract for the whole 
season. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm trying to think if it's her. Yeah, because she's she's got that robot thing, and she kind of I think she sacrifices herself or something like that. Yeah, well, I didn't spoil it, but you did. Oh. <laughs> well, it's been it's been more it's been over a year. Like, come on, I guess. So. What's yeah. the statute of limitations on bad sci-fi? That's true. Really? Yeah, yeah, and it is bad sci-fi. <laughs> <laughs> it's bad Star Trek. Yeah, you know, part part of the problem for me is that I've been binge watching it or trying to binge watch it. Right. Yeah. Uh, and you know, I can imagine one episode a week might not be so bad, but trying to watch, you know, a couple of episodes a day is just, you just can't do it. I had to stop. Really? Well, see, this is the, I have the exact opposite problem. I've been watching, uh, I watched the first season of, um, of Ozark, right? I mean, I, I, I was going to watch it like when it first came on, but I yeah. never got around to it. Yep. And then, uh, and then, you know, so I watched the first season almost, almost straight through. And then, yeah. uh, I started watching the second season and I've been, I've been pacing myself. I let, I watch one show after work and then, and then, uh, you know, kind of like, and then I, you know, maybe I'll watch two and I kind of thing. Right. So I'm kind of pacing myself. I just watched the, uh, fourth episode. Right. But I'm saying when, when something is good, you can binge watch it, but when something, oh, I know, but the worst part is like, I'm watching it and then like, you know, it's like 20 after nine and I'm like, and, and it just ends on a cliffhanger and you're like, Oh man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You gotta go do a podcast now. <laughs> it sucks. <laughs> yeah. 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 For sure. We're just talking about how wonderful Discovery is. I mean, yeah. Mark's, Mark's come around. He's finally realized how wonderful it is as yeah. a show. <laughs> <laughs> So I did watch the one, Jaime, I mean, that you said was pretty good. It was the Talos 4 one. Mm-hmm. Well, maybe there's more, but... Um, oh, right, yeah. I, I, so it was like episode that eight. Was a good one. And that one was pretty good. But, you know, the fact that they had to depend, they had to lean on the old Star Trek yeah. to to get any kind of story yeah. that was any good it was kind of sad, but oh well. Yeah. Well, it's funny. They're, they're, I think that a lot of the reasons why they go to these places and, and, and do the things that they do, they, they I hate to spoil it for you, but they, they do come back in, in a sense. Like, they're there's a reason why they went to Talos, right? Um, there's a reason why um, Harry Mudd has that encounter with the big space whale thing, right? And, you know, it, it all comes around, right? Like, like they have these long arcs that some stuff takes a long time to pay off, but... Yeah, okay. Yeah. I mean, and it, and but see, my, my big problem with Discovery is, like, you know, the original Star Trek guys, I mean, the original Star Trek was basically, you know, id, ego, and super ego, which is Kirk and McCoy and Spock, right? And, um, and they kind of developed over time. And I remember... I remember when watching those, like probably the second or third time through watching them, I think more as, as I got to, got to be an adult, realizing that these guys had this sort of this sort of playing off each other, the way Kirk and, or the way Spock and McCoy would stand back and look at Kirk and kind of poke at him a bit, right? Mm-hmm. Um, that had a sort of dynamic. And, and yeah, like you said, I think I watched an episode a couple of weeks ago and, and the, 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 the sci-fi jargon was so way out there. Like I'm sure that if you were like a, a proper engineer in the day, you probably would have been cringing, right? Right? But um, but for those of us you know who were novices to science and stuff like that, it, it kind of fooled us, right? But and then to have a show like this, like prequels, like the idea of a prequel coming in and trying to dovetail into there's so many for me unanswered things. Like okay, they had this quantum, what do they call it, quantum drive or something like that, right? Where was that when Kirk needed it? You know, oh the spore drive, spore right? drive. That's it. Yeah, I mean, spore what, drive. yeah, yeah. What the hell? I mean, it, it, and yeah. it's just it's stupid. There's like <laughs> there's like funguses that live in space. Yeah, tell, tell, that tell are it, yeah. creating this well mycelium network exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah, I mean it's just dumb. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's the midichlorians again, right? So yeah, but uh, yeah, I mean, so for me, like the, the the challenging thing about prequels is how do they dovetail into where the story story starts from? Right? I mean, even even if you think like on the Star Wars side, you got Rogue One, and Rogue One has to dovetail right into you know uh, a New Hope, as we're calling it now. But yeah, and what's with all this holographic uh, communication? stuff that doesn't exist in... in oh, the part where, where Sarah can talk to, to his daughter without actually being in the room kind of thing, you mean? Well, there's that, that, stuff? There's that yeah, that, tele- that, that tele- tele- time, telepathy we, stuff, honey? but but there's all this holography. They have these, they, it's like, you know, it's like Star Wars holograms yeah, yeah. To, to use to talk force, to each other. Yeah, the Force stuff, yeah. But they never had that in Star, in Kirk Star Trek or they, 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 Star Trek. They have a or, throwaway line that actually ends up addressing that. I'm not saying it's a good way to address it, but it was a way. <laughs> <laughs> it was a very, very Casual the throwaway line? line, but I'm not sure how far you are in the in the series. Uh, there was one line where where I think Pike said something about banning it on the Enterprise for some reason. Yeah, he was like, right? "Rip it out, I hate it." 
right? So yeah, yeah, timeline but, restored. But no, but it doesn't <laughs> restore because because there were there was at least one time, and actually many times, where either Kirk or Picard or somebody else went somewhere else in the Federation, and they didn't have the hol- the holograms there either. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So That's- did they rip it out of the entire Federation because Pike said that? I don't think so. Maybe he's very influential on Instagram. Maybe he's you very know? influential. He's like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you look at the splash screen. How much better it is in this stop 3D thing, you know, like the wharf yeah. thing we yeah. talked about the bumps on our hedge, right? Right. That, that, yeah. There was that too. Yeah. What are you going to do? Yeah, I think that, you know, I, I, I like the idea. I mean, I like the, I like the world. I like I like the whole sort of Federation thing. Um, I kind of, I kind of, I mean, I kind of appreciate what J.J. Abrams is trying to do with it by taking the characters and retelling the story, you know, like, like going down a different, like changing the timeline and getting into, you know, oh, we blow up Vulcan and, and you know, now we have a completely different Federation or, or universe, right? That I don't mind. But when, yeah, like my, my big problem is like, I love recurring characters. Don't get me wrong. And, you know, in sci-fi, that can be really great. I mean, Asimov used to do it. Heinlein used to do it. You know, um, Arthur C. Clarke would resurrect people that had, you know, long since been dead, you know, kind of thing. But but they did it in an intelligent way that made that would make sense, you know? Like, it wasn't just for the sake of nostalgia or, or frankly, to make a buck, right? Yeah. You know, so... Uh, yeah, so my, my big problem with a lot of bad sci-fi and what, to me, differentiates between good sci-fi and bad sci-fi is self-consistency. You create a universe, you set up the rules and right, yeah. yeah i mean the rules can be non you know can not compliant with with like our physics right it's faster than light travel and stuff like that right, right you can yeah. do that you but but you set up your rules and then you stick to them and make everything self consistent with it within the rules that you set up and right. and as soon as as soon as you start having like deus ex machina to get around that stuff or breaking the rules because of plot conveniences that's when the story gets bad that's when you lose it right yeah that's my yeah, when you start falling back on cheap cheap things i mean yeah. like we've talked about this before not necessarily on this show but on sparkcast we have right in that you know when when asimov and and those kind of guys sat down and they created a universe right yeah like you said they would create these rules and and the universe might be like from like you take the foundation for instance, instance like that goes from Earth to like way out there you know yeah, yeah. and he tell he's he's probably I don't know what seven eight books around around the foundation sort of stories and and they all kind of dovetail back to this central you know world where the, the prehistory guy had lived right but well, he, um, and, he, and he tied them all into the uh, all the robot books too yeah I mean yeah. so so he didn't like he yeah he, he went off and told another story but he but and he wrapped them all in and. I, I kind of question sometimes, like when he wrote The Naked Sun, you know, I, I got into that through The Robots of Dawn, but I went back and read Caves of Steel and The Naked Sun, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and then, then I went back and I read the Foundation series, right? So I read them all out of order from how he wrote them. But, you know, when you think about it, like when he wrote The Foundation back in the 50s and then he wrote like Robots of Dawn in, in like the late 80s, right? Um, by the time he got to Robots of Dawn, he could ex- he could have expanded on this, this sort of universe he had, but he didn't go back and rewrite the rules, right? Right, right. You know, even he did a pre- prequel. He had the pre- prelude to the foundation, and and it wasn't a horrible, you know, money grab. It it actually kind of made sense, right? But yeah. well, it was kind of a money grab when yeah, you merged the two. Was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, Asimov was was classic old school hard science sci fi, right. as opposed to space opera sci fi. Yeah, yeah. Where the rules are much more loose. So if you're, if well, you're hard Highland science- was a bit Highland was a bit of mix of both. He was you yeah, know, yeah. He had science, but he also had a lot of nostalgia and stuff like that. Yep, yep, yeah. Oh. yeah. Yeah, so when you're a hard science guy, you're fo- you're basically following real physics for right, most exactly. of it. So yeah. so um, yeah. yeah, so you can it's easy to stay consistent or easier to stay consistent. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, like, or you take someone like Arthur C. Clarke, who had like the oh, yeah. with Rama series, right? He's he was the ultimate hard science guy. Yeah, and then he yeah. had the Odyssey stories, right? And and you know he could have tied those two together, but he never did. You know, mm-hmm. like you know, yeah. So, anyway, yeah. Lessons we could learn from, but I mean, you know, I don't know. Like, I wonder if I wonder if uh, current um, you know Hollywoodism. Or, or what do you want to call it? You know, drives the way that science fiction is is told. I mean, they have to pitch it and sell it and yeah, fund every, it. And, everything has to be an alternate universe now. Everything has to have time travel now. Right, it's kind of right. Yeah, yeah. Enough of that. Yep. yep. <laughs> I got my Bobby Orr uh, picture framed finally. Mm. I ordered a frame from Amazon like three weeks ago. It finally showed up. <laughs> I don't know what they're doing over there, but they're doing essential items here first, and then yeah. when they have capacity, they, they 
they do the other stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to order a, a book on um, implementing OAuth 2 servers that I'm going to assume is going to be a few weeks from now delivery. But I, mm. I'll let you guys know when I make the order. Mm-hmm. You don't want the electronic version? I can't sit back and thumb through an electronic yeah, version. Yeah, I get it. And this is, this is more yeah. the, the thumbing through to get sort of what I need versus uh, just search reference, you know? Yeah, if you had an iPhone Pro or iPad Pro, you could you could flip back through it. It's not exactly the same. Like, uh, the interaction between, you know, jumping between different, you know, just literally holding with hand manipulation a few different sections at once that you want to compare. Yeah. Challenging yeah. to do in a digital format. Yeah. But yeah, I've got, you know, stuff in Dropbox that I have as my, my offline reading material uh, for whenever we're able to do air travel again. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny. I bought, I, the other day I bought a book that I've been looking for for a long time. I finally found, I found it for like three bucks on Kindle. I bought it and yeah, like I haven't sat down and gone through it yet, you know, where I'll let you talk about this stuff. Anywho. I think I'm going to call it a day and go watch some more uh, Ozark. Some more Ozark. <laughs> so, so what's happening right now? Um, oh, the the FBI just showed up at the house and and uh, oh, okay, it, season yeah. two, right? Yeah, or season middle one, season, season middle two, of season yeah. two. Yeah, cool. the, the, nice. the jerk guy just showed up and they all get sat on the floor and now I'm just waiting to see what uh, what happens. I'm sure I, yep. I my my gut. I mean, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but my gut is that they're going to th- he's going to find the kids' money that they, they they took and put aside and that's going to be the the linchpin. Because I'm pretty sure they don't keep their money in the house, right? I'm not saying anything. <laughs> Ozark takes place in Missouri, then, given the yes. name? Okay. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Chicago, I think, actually. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I've got... Yeah. There are there are shades of Breaking Bad in there, for sure. There's the... the uh, Yeah, the, the very overall concept is very is kind of similar. Yeah. And, and the... Yeah, and the uh, the whole way of, of incrementally things just get worse and worse and worse and worse. Yeah. Season three was really good to it. I thought it started off a little bit slow, but then it really picked up. All right. Talk to you later. Have a good night. Night. Bye.